everyone. And I can say that to everyone. In particular to the mothers that are in attendance today. I was listening to my dear brother as he was opening up, his brother Greg was opening, and had some thoughts of, of my mother as well and some of the ways that, that she had and some of the things that she would say. And um, mine, like many of yours, are not here anymore, but I remember them fondly. And, and I remember many of the things that, they used, that she used to say and do. Today, as the Lord allows God, we're, we're kind of preaching topically here, and I generally don't do this, but the Lord laid this on my heart, so, so here we go. What I like in, in this uh, proverb, in Proverbs 31, he begins in this section, and he's speaking about a mother who's actually talking to her son, who's, who's a king. And, and she's giving him godly wisdom, a motherly godly wisdom, so that he will rule as God would have him to rule and not as he would rule himself. So she gives him some great wisdom here, and it's godly wisdom, and I love this. And, and, and it begins as he's talking about this king, and, and, and it kind of shows him some of the pitfalls he need, pitfalls that, that he needs to avoid and some of the ways that he should not go if, indeed, he's going to be a ruler that's one of God's own heart. In chapter 31, beginning at verse 1, and that should be page 590, if you're using a pew Bible, and if you're with me, please say amen. amen. And it begins here, he says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. And, and it says prophecy, so it's something that God gave her to give to her son, and, and she's using godly wisdom here. In verse 2 it says, what, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows, and we see that the mom repeats it three times, and, and we're saying that she does that because she loves her son just that much, and she also wants him to do right. So when she repeats it three times to get his attention, it kind of reminds me of my mother when she would call my name, and, and I act like I never even heard her, and she would repeat it again, and, and sometimes I still act like I didn't hear her, but she would repeat it again in such a tone that I knew that I better react to that third time. It says in verse 3, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to which it says, or to that which destroys kings. And, and look, we know during that time the kings would, would have a, not only a wife, but they would have a whole lot of wives. And, and sometimes the kings would marry, have a harem, and they would marry ungodly women. And these ungodly women would take his mind and even his rule away from the things of God and would, would capture him with their lust and, and would take him to a place where he really did not want to go. And this godly mother is giving him advice in regard to his rule that you need to stay where God will have you to be. If you're going to have a wife, have a godly wife because if you get an ungodly wife, she's going to sway you to a place where God would not have you to be. She goes on with her wisdom in verse 4. He says, It is not for kings, only let me open. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. And look, he's talking, she's talking about a godly leader. And look, he needs to be under the control of God. And if he gets with strong drink, he's going to be under the influence of another spirit that's not a godly spirit. And it's going to lead him to lead by his flesh as a part, as opposed to leading by his heart that God is trying to lead. And listen, the result of that, if he went that route, would be uh, verse 5, lest they drink and forget the law, and he's talking about God's law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And listen, they would leave God's control and they would be under self-control. And if, self, if they're under self-control, then it's fleshly, worldly control, and no telling what he might come down with a verdict in regard to being a leader and supposed to be leading his people well, that he very well might do something that he should not do. And, and she goes on with her wisdom in, in verse 6. It says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto them that be of heavy hearts. So she's almost pointing toward medicinal use. There are some that, that look during that time they didn't have a lot of medicines, and they would use that to help calm them down, sometimes to stop the pain. And, and they're saying, for someone who's laid up on their back, 
Use it for that, but don't use it as a, a sedative while you're in office trying to roll. She goes on, verse 7. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And, and guys, by the way, that can be pointing towards someone who is terminally ill and, and there's nothing else that they can do and they're trying to comfort them or comfort her or he as best as they can. And, and it would also, some, some who are on death row, that they would actually give wine or, or and we know when Christ was on the, on the cross that they would give to those that were being crucified, they would give them vinegar mixed with myrrh. And, and this myrrh was some type of an anesthetic and, and it would help the pain go around and, or, or go away. And we know that when Christ tasted that, that anesthetic, he would not drink it because he wanted to feel the full brunt of what they were doing to him. But there are times, and, and, and that's what the advice of this mother is giving her son, that you use it for those times, but don't use it in normal times. In verse 8, she says, open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause, it says, of all such as are pointed to destruction. And again, it's talking about a king who's ruling, and it says dumb here. He's not talking about somebody who's ignorant, but he's talking about the people, the poverty-stricken people that can't speak for themselves, that he's to be their mouthpiece, and he's to give godly instruction and make sure he does right by them. Make sure that he's being a, a, a sovereign that's ruling in a way that's fair and impartial and even showing compassion. It says in verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 9, open thy mouth, judge rightly or righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. And, and again, this king would need to have a, a clear head, and if he's going to rule his people correctly and do right by them, that he does not need to be uh, under the influence of strong drink, but he needs to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit or of God that would lead him to lead correctly. And, and listen, through these first nine verses, we see the, the wisdom of a mother to a son who's a leader, and if he were to follow those instructions, then all in his kingdom, at least in his earthly kingdom, would be okay. Please be prayerful with me as I preach around this subject, a virtual, virtuous woman indeed. And Father, as we dive deeper into this proverb, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, for, for myself, Lord, that you'll bless me and minister to me for what I've studied throughout this, this section of scripture. And Father God, allow me to give the answers and even some clarity in regard to what's being said here. And Father, even bring it up to date to where we are now to make it applicable to all our mothers and, and ladies that are in the house even today. I ask, Father God, that you touch and bless the mothers. And Father God, even those that aren't, uh, and, and for the children of the mothers that aren't here, that this is a day that, that really can bring pain to their hearts and even the sons. And Father God, that you'll minister to them and Bless them and, and help them to realize that because you're here and they're in you, that somehow everything is going to be okay. And Father, we even ask that you use these verses, that, that, and you can do this, that, that if someone is far from you, if someone is not right with you, that you can use these very same verses to bless their hearts into a true and righteous relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom we pray with much thanksgiving. Amen. And amen. Chapter 31, beginning at verse 10. If you're with me, say amen. amen. And the verse says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And, and listen, what the proverb is writing about, he's saying that if you find one of these virtuous women, that it is no price you can put on her head in regard to what you would pay to have one. And, and, and as we go down and see some of the characteristics of this virtuous woman, it's not saying that, that you are, 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 are all there, but it is saying as you read, you'll see some of the characteristics of yourself, some of your parents, and, and I think it's also something to strive for in regard to being a godly woman. This word virtuous simply means having or showing high moral standards and those moral standards, they don't come from ourself, but they truly come from the Lord. He goes on in verse 11, still speaking about her, 
He said, the heart of a husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoils. And, and listen, this morning to a, a husband that's married to a, to a wife or to a woman that's virtuous, and he, he doesn't have to look for any need outside of the home because everything's being taken care of right there. He doesn't have to have a roving eye. He doesn't have to worry about what John is doing over there with his wife or, or Sam is doing over there with his wife because he's in content in the lady that the Lord has sent him and, and she indeed is the wife of his youth. He goes on about her and, and it says in, in uh, uh, verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And, and again, no need to be jealous no need to worry about where she's at because she is one who's connected to him. The Lord has given her a husband and not only a husband, and we'll see, given her children as well. And she's doing rightly by them both. It says in verse 13, and it's talking about some of the things that she actually does. It says she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly, the verse says, with her hands. And look, we know back then they were doing a whole lot of, of, of making of clothes. And, and it also reminds me of my mother. She, she sold for a living. And then she would come home and she would mend our clothes. She would make much of our own clothes. And, and it reminds me, even, even my wife, like when she goes and, and, and when she shops, she's looking for bargains. But she's not looking for cheap. But she's looking for something less expensive. She'll go from one store to the next. She'll comparison shop. Where I go in the store and I just grab something that, and, and look, even though I might know it's cheaper over there, I'll go ahead and grab it. But she's looking for the best bang for a buck. She's looking for a bargain, but not looking for something cheap, looking for something that's going to last. And, and this woman, woman is one who would do that even in her time. In verse 14 it says, she is like the, she is like the merchants of ships. She bringeth her food from afar. And again, many ladies do this, and they'll go from one store, and they say, well, this food over here is okay, but I bought some over here before. It wasn't right. It was spoiled or whatever. They've got the same thing, different packaging, and I can get it for less dollars over here. And this woman is doing the best that she can for her family, not just for her and not just to be seen. She's doing it because she wants the best for her family, for the least that she can spend. We see in verse 15, she rises up also while it is yet night and giving meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So she's planning, she's thinking about what, what's, what we're going to eat tomorrow and, and, and what we're going to eat the next day and what we're going to do from that. And, and even those that work for her, she's making sure that they're taken care of and, and not just her husband and her children, but she's making sure, making sure that everybody in the house is taken care of. And, and this thing is already planned out. It's not a last minute thing. It's already in a thought in her head and she does that. And there are many women and many mothers on this day that do the same thing. In verse 16 it says, She considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hands. She planteth a vineyard. And look, always looking for things that's going to enhance the family. Always looking for things that's going to make things better for the family. And seldom looking for things that's going to be better just for herself. She always has her family in mind. And she finds a way always, and my wife is kind of like this as well, to always, always somehow have a couple of dollars stashed away. I used to watch my mother, and she was a single parent. She would work a full-time job. She would take care of us who were kids, four of us. And somehow she always had some extra money. She had a mortgage, had to buy food, and somehow she would stash away this and stash away that. And my wife does that as well. And my pockets always seem like they turn inside out. But it seems that in, in regard to this virtuous woman and many women of our time, including of our past, they always seem to find a way to stash a little bit here and a little bit there. And that little bit here and that little bit there would eventually mount up to something that if an emergency came up, they had something to use for that emergency. In verse 17, it says, She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. And look, that's pointing to one that, that she's not lazy. She doesn't mind working. 
And, and look, might not always have the time to, to do physical exercise or set aside time for exercise, but her activities that she's involved in, it keeps her physically fit. And it keeps her mentally sharp because she's not sitting around just watching soap operas all day long. She's trying to see how she can enhance the life of her family in every which way that she can. Verse 18 says she perceiveth a merchandise is, uh, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. So she produces the best for her family. And sometimes she'll even do some things that, to be able to sell here or sell there or, or, or even take in some sewing or, or a laundry for somebody. Always looking to enhance even her husband's salary and enhance the household finances with the things that she thinks and the things that she does. We see in verse 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle. In her hands, it says, hold it this staff. So it's pointing to her making or mending clothing. And, and by the way, she, she's taking inventory of what's needed. If, if, if I have or you have some, something that's torn, she already sees it and she's thinking about fixing it. And, and this woman as well, she's uh, two steps ahead of what the others in the family are thinking and has already figured out what they are needed in the house. And, and look, though the man is the head of the home, she is the manager. And she's the one that dictates what needs to go where and when it needs to go there. She strengthened, verse 20, her hand to the poor, or stretches her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. And, and listen, with everything that she's doing at home, she also has a mind to want to do for others. And, and look, if she sees that Miss Sally doesn't have in the corner of her eye, she's going to work something out to be able to help her. Or, or this one is ailing in her body and can't do, she's going to take some time to take care of them. And, and again, this virtuous woman is somebody who is blessed of God to not only take care of her own family, but to take care of others as well as the Lord allows. In verse 21 it says, She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. And, and guys, because she's not just taking care of her family, that she's taking care of the needy and others that are in need. Guess who takes care of her? None other than God himself. He blesses and, and sends things her way and, and allows her to be able to do for her family and, and to be a blessing not only to the family, but the Lord is a blessing to her as well because her mindset is to serve her family, but in reality she's serving the Lord with everything that she has and she puts it all on the table and the Lord blesses her efforts because of that. Verse 22 says, She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. And again, the Lord blessing. Verse 23, and, and, and look, she presents well even her husband. Verse 23 says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. And, and, and listen, her husband is there and, and he, she dresses him nice. She makes sure that he's presentable. And even in our conversation about her husband, she's always building him up, never tearing him down. And look, her husband's not perfect, but they take care of that at home. They don't try to, this, this virtuous woman doesn't try to tear him down in front of other folk. They give that to the Lord, and they work that out between uh, the Lord themselves and their husband. But they don't try to publicly make him look bad in front of of other folk. It says in verse 23, her husband is known in the gates. When he sitteth among the elders of the land, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. In, in other words, an outside source of income trying to circumvent some of what her husband makes as well, just trying to add to the household monies. It says strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice. It says in time to come. And, and listen, what he's saying is that the, her character, her whole character is, is, is the character of a godly woman. That when you see her, though she might not have on the best clothes, that she presents herself in such a way from the inside out that she looks beautiful because of the spirit of God that she's working in and, and, and is pleasant and peaceful all because of the Lord she serves. 
She opened it, it says her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. And again, a godly woman who believes God, and when everybody else is doubting, when things might look bad, because it's not going to always be smooth sailing all the time, she is the one that's uplifting. She is the one that says God's going to make a way. She is the one that pumps everybody else up and tells them, don't get so downhearted. Somehow it's going to be okay. I, I can recall sometimes even in my household when growing up, and it was our children, it was us, we children, and my mother and my dad was out of the picture, surely wasn't giving anything to the household. And somehow my mom would always make us feel like it was going to be okay, especially around Christmas time and, and gifts had to be given. Somehow she would work that thing out and, and listen, she wasn't working on, on her own spirit, but I believe God was blessing her to be able to do what she did. And she never really wanted the, the credit while she was on earth but we would give her credit anyhow. And that would be one of the criteria of the virtuous women. And, and look, my mother wasn't perfect, surely. But in that area, she surely excelled. And, and by the way, this virtuous woman excels above and beyond all of them. It says in verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth, it says, not the bread of idleness. In other words, she's not lazy. She's always looking to help in her household or help her children or help uh, uh, fix up the house or whatever it is she can do. She's not just sitting around resting on her laurels. She's always looking to enhance the godly home that God has placed her in. Her children arise up, verse 28 says, and call her blessed, her husband also, and she praises, and, and he praises her. And, and listen, her, her family looks at her, and they look at what she's done with the little that they have. And, and the husband knows that, look, I, I got a good woman here. And, and I needed to let everybody know that she's a good woman. She's taking care of me. And, and the husband even knows I'm not perfect. And, and I surely got some frailties. I got some issues. But even in the midst of that, she keeps the peace in the home. She keeps the home managed well. And she makes sure that all of us are doing well, even sometimes when they don't have, that she works it out some kind of way that the Lord gives her wisdom to be able to see some things that many times men, husbands, just don't see. Many daughters, verse 29 says, have done virtuously, but thou exceedeth, ex or excelleth them all. In other words, she had been blessed so by God and doing what God would have them that he's blessed her above and beyond. And she never looks at herself. She's always looking at her family for them to do better or looking at others to help them do better. And that's her character because it comes from the inside and it shows itself on the outside. We see in verse 30, favor is deceitful. And some of your translations might say charm. And it's talking about the, 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 the beauty or the outward beauty that you have when you're younger. And listen, sooner or later, that is going to fade. And we can look in the mirror and say amen to that. But what he's saying about this woman, that the beauty that she has or the favor that she has come from God. And it comes from within his Holy Spirit. And it shows itself on the outside. And guys, I got to tell you, a godly woman will look godly, will look favorable, will even look beauty long into her old age because it has nothing to do with her skin and her face and how she looks, but it has everything to do with her heart and the spirit of God that's in it and how he presents himself through her actual features. There are some ladies I see, and I've asked a few, I said, well, how come you're always smiling? And they'll say, well, this is not really a smile. This is just my face, that the joy of the Lord is in my heart, and it shows itself on the outside. And, and that would be one of the characteristics of this virtuous woman. It says, favor is deceitful. In other words, it's going to pass, and beauty is vain. And we talk about that, that, that's that, out, that beauty that, that folk want to, when they get older, then they want to get plucked and ducked and get all this stuff rearranged. And, and that really looks a fright to me. It says, but a woman that feareth the Lord, 
she shall be praised. And, and listen, there's one that has reverence of God. And, and look, man doesn't have to praise her because God is lifting her up and saying that that's a woman that's after my own heart. Amen. And go with me for, for a, a hot minute back to Proverbs chapter 3. That should be page 572, I think it is. Thank you, Lord. 572, Proverbs 3. Look at verse 1. Just want to look at a few other verses here. Again, Proverbs, a book of wisdom. And we see wisdom here in chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If you're there, say amen. And the verse says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. In other words, he's saying that, that we ought to be walking in godliness, and, and we ought to be walking in godliness all the days of our lives. And, and it even is a promise that's attached to that. Look at verse 2. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. And, and look, many times folks are asked, that, what's the secret of long living? Do right by God, and every year that you're supposed to get on this side, you will get. But consequently, on the other side, if you don't do right by God, you might leave here at a time when folks say they left too soon. Verse 3 says, Let mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. In other words, guys, we are to make them part of our very being. Not something we just simply add on on Sundays, but it's part of our everyday living that we're going to do right. And not so much for my sake, but we're going to do right for God's sake. Verse 4 says, so shall thy find favor and good understanding. And this is key. In the sight of God. In other words, when we please God, and the verse doesn't stop there, it says, and man. So when we please God, we're going to please man. And if we don't, it's still okay. And he goes into verse 5. And he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, it says, acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. And, and listen, what the, this, this proverb is trying to tell us in, in regard to living a godly life and, and toward the end, especially beginning at verse 5, we see what this virtuous woman does, that she trusts in the Lord and she lives by his precepts and not by her own, which is why she's blessed. Her household is blessed. And, and by the way, we can take a little bit of this for ourselves if indeed we want to live a life on this side that's blessed of God. Flip back to Proverbs 31. Look at verse 30. Still speaking about this virtuous woman. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And what the proverb is saying as he ends at verse 31, that she doesn't have to pump herself up. In fact, she doesn't much care whether or not somebody else pumps her up. But how she lives and her character shows itself for what it truly is. One that's not selfish, one that's not self-centered, one that loves the Lord, and because of that, she loves her family and loves her neighbors as well. This whole thing started off with a question. It said, who can find a virtuous woman for the, her price is far above rubies? And guys, we have had our mothers, and some still have their mothers. And though they don't have all these qualities, there were many of these qualities that we saw in our parents and we saw in our mothers. And because of that, we have been blessed to have been in their presence and to have been their children. Amen? Amen. Something here for all of us. And listen, there's something surely for our mothers or grandparents, grandmothers to grow to. 
Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, for these few moments that we can look at a few verses as we talk about uh, women on, on Mother's Day. And Father God, how you bless this virtuous woman. And because of you, Lord, she was blessed and our family was blessed. And, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll touch and bless each of us and minister to us, Father God, throughout your word. Father, we ask on this day as we're going to kind of break a little early and let uh, families go and, and, and be a, a blessing to their families. And Father God, to celebrate that, that this day that we have set aside for mothers. And I pray that they have a prosperous celebration. And that they too can give you all the honor, praise, and glory for this day that you have granted by your grace and by your mercy. Lord, we have a poem here in our bulletins, and including this in our prayer, I'd like to read it. And it simply says, thank God for mother's love. There is no love like a mother's love, no stronger bond on earth like the precious bond that comes from God to a mother when she gives birth. A mother's love is forever strong, never changing for all time. And when her children need her most, a mother's love will shine. God bless these special mothers. God bless them, everyone, for all the tears and heartaches and for the special work they've done. And when our days on earth are over, a mother's love lives on through many generations with God's blessing on each one. Be thankful for our mothers, for they love with a higher love from the power of God has given and the strength from up above. Lord, we thank you for our mothers, for all the ladies and all the mothers. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Enjoy.